Hey, welcome back to another episode of Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Enablement Show. Um, we're in AI land, and what we're doing now is we're sort of taking apart some of the original discussion that we had on this topic around danger and what you have to pay attention to when it comes to AI. So let's bring the architects back in for another one of these, these pieces. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Hey, guys. Well, hello. It's delightful to see you. Um, I was hoping we would take a moment to work on the part of the initial conversation that we had about responsible AI, which sounds super cool, but I don't think it's necessarily um, as well understood. And I think it would be really good for us to talk about what we mean by responsible AI. Um, and, and what it entails, because it's, it seems to be absolutely crucial to if you're going to start doing this stuff as an architect, as a company, as you know, an organization. So what's, what do we mean when we say responsible AI in this context? So responsible AI came out of the initial usage of algorithms to make decisions, mostly statistics, machine learning capabilities. Um, I think we used some of the examples in the charter um, conversation where you effectively go and saying, okay, if I make credit decisions or if I make decisions about teacher grades using AI and data, I need to make sure that the data is correct or that the data isn't biased, um, that I really have as fair a evaluation as possible and so forth. So that's how originally responsible AI as a movement started. And it talks about transparency, fairness, bias, uh, those kind of elements. And you can find lots of um, literature about it. Now with large language models, it gets even more important because they've been used more broadly. Uh, whereas the statistical models were in a specific domain and they were managed by specialists. What large language models and applications like ChatGPT have done is they've democratized the usage of AI to pretty much every person on the planet. And now everybody is using it. So this notion of responsibly using AI, both as a provider, as well as a consumer is becoming really important and, or even more important than it was when we just looked at statistics. Yeah. I, I, I think that the way that I, um, extract, um, meaning in all of that, and it would at least have a hundred percent, right. Um, I think about it in terms of unintended consequences. Nobody sets out to build a harmful biased or, um, jeopardized, uh, LLM implementation. Ideally, but the question, does. I, ideally, <laughs> yes, we would hope that most people don't, most organizations don't that can be sued and held accountable. Right. But so, but assuming that accountable parties don't want to, uh, hurt people. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, Sorry. I just want to, right. Human anatomy, yeah. et cetera. Keep on going. No, yeah. no. But I, I think I think my, my big point here, what I'm extracting is um, you want to make sure that the unintended consequences become known to you prior to doing anything meaningful. And unintended harms and unintended consequences might be, um, you know, bias against a subpopulation of individuals, usage patterns in which you hadn't seen before based on your use case definition. Um, once it's important, once it's actually implemented and super popular, wow, it's going all over the world, it's going global. Maybe there are cultural norms and behaviors yeah. that I haven't even taken into account for this English trained LLN uh, at the core of my, you know, my uh, app, for example. Do you, so here's, here's where I get a little, I'm not trying to be controversial, but I suspect there are people that say, we, I mean, we just had whole conversations about the things you can't know and the things you have to sort of like do your best to work around to make sure that the right stuff goes in and the right stuff comes out. Um, so are there people, I, I suspect there are people who are like, can we do responsible AI if we don't actually, you know, have all the levers if we don't actually have all the knobs if we can't do this. So yeah. um, is, is it, is it a goal? Is it possible? Is it like, or is, is it like, oh yeah, no problem. We got this. I think, I think it's going to be, um, what, what's the saying? Moving the goalposts. And I, I think we said this in our charter discussion, it's got to be a live and continuous set of vigilant practices and procedures and reviews that every organization and every team has to implement. The goalposts will keep moving as LLMs get better, more widely utilized, more implemented in more places. You're going to have to continue to increase your hypervigilance around what's going into it. What am I giving it as my libraries of expertise? And then what's coming out of it? 
studying how people interact with it, keeping a log of prompts and responses, and continually and aggressively and vigilantly analyzing it, those goalposts will move. Um, so you, you're going to have to be able to be vigilant. Yep. And the, to answer your question, David, a bit more directly, it is not only possible to be a responsible user of AI, it is mandatory. You have to be. Because as uh, Eric said, you are ultimately responsible and accountable for what this model does or doesn't do because you are presenting it to the world. Be that an internal world or an external world doesn't really matter. Um, and therefore, it's up to you to figure out how to go and drive this responsible AI capability. And the LLM world has made this a bit more complicated. Um, in the old world, you were completely in charge of what the how the model works, what the model is, right, what the right. data is that the model works on, and the application usage. So you had all elements under your control, even if you were uh, buying the capability. Um, but my view is, the idea is, hey, how are we going to go and now say, I am buying something where I don't know what the data is that the system got trained for. I don't know the algorithm. So now I'm buying a black box. And the black box is super powerful, like again, in the open AI or um, Gemini models and so forth have shown. They can answer questions in an amazing way. They have lots of knowledge. So now you want to use them, but now you are still a responsible AI user. Now you say, okay, how do I do that? And um, as we've said in the first uh, episode, but we're doubling down on this one now, it's to say, okay, what can you control? So oftentimes I see people saying uh, they get mad when the sun gets up. Well, sorry, you can't control that the sun goes up or down. What you can control is A, which model you use. We'll talk about more about that later. Uh, but now that you picked a black box model, let's assume that, now you cannot control what the data set is that it got trained on, how it got trained, what the algorithm ends, that's out of your control. So think about right. it, sun rising, done. Right. Now what you can control is, okay, you're asking the model questions. So that's a prompt and you engineer that prompt. That you, is effectively in your control. And what I said in the original model is you could argue that a prompt, because it's structured, you control it, the text that gets sent by the human that uses the prompt is not under your control, but you can do certain things to it in terms of understanding that it's violent language or bad language, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do all of that. Now you can say, I can prove to my user that the prompt that I engineer is following responsible guidelines. Mm -hmm. So that's something you can prove. And then it goes into the black box, it gets processed. And on the return path, you effectively, again, you can structure the response. While the, the LLM will tell you that it is effectively uh, going and putting text out, there's many ways to use prompt engineering to, for example, force the model to respond in JSON. Right. So where you get a JSON schema and everything that doesn't fit into the schema gets automatically rejected. And you can reason over that JSON schema programmatically to make sure that the content that got returned is the right one, is not biased, blah, blah, blah. And then you can go and feed that into your application. So it's effectively a different way of thinking about responsible AI, where you go from explainable AI, meaning transparent algorithms, transparent data sets, to observable AI, where you observe the inputs and the outputs rather than understanding the machinery. So, so that makes perfect sense to me, and I'd love to dig into it in, in certain directions. But the thing I think I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask is, this is armchair architects. Um, some of what we talked about here, we've talked about here, feels very feels pretty specific to, to architects. Some of it is less so, and everybody has a general responsibility. I'm just curious if either of you have, even taking the last example, right? That seemed there's I heard stuff that I would think of as an architect could could do. What, from a strictly architect's perspective, what can they do towards responsible AI? Or perhaps the, what's the next thing they should do? Like if you're like, hey, here's the thing you should consider doing. An LLM has shown up at your doorstep. What should you as an architect be standing be standing on the on the, on the table saying, we are now going to do this? Well, let me give you two very concrete things that um, you should do. And then Eric can add uh, perspective. Sure. 
So Great. the way I think about this is uh, pick a responsible AI provider. Let's say you pick Microsoft with Azure OpenAI, or you pick Just Google with Gemini, whatever it uh -huh. is, but pick one. Then you say, okay, I'm going to use a technique and technologies out there. Um, mm -hmm. Like there's uh, technologies that effectively um, filter the prompt for specific um, words, violence, and so forth, and right. also the response, content safety. And then the last piece is there's open source technologies like type chat, one word, type chat, uh, that effectively will go and help you build the prompt and the response in a structured way that is using a JSON to help you with schematized uh, response, which is effectively early binding of the response type, which means your applications can A, easier consume it, and you can easier validate it. And that's really a very practical way saying there is a GitHub project called TypeChat. Just go search for it in your favorite search engine. You will find it and it has very clear instructions of what to do. And some of the LLMs effectively are starting to take uh, the same route where you can uh, inside the prompt do inline a request to the LLM to respond in JSON, for example. So that's a very concrete way of saying pick the right thing, think about content safety, and then think about your application layer through cap capabilities like type chat. Um, and there are other ways to do it, but that's a very concrete way of doing it. Eric, give me some more concrete things to end this episode with. Yeah, I, I think that those are all great detailed um, implementation steps. So to me, the big rocks around what Uli said are pre-filtering and moderation, utilizing your provider's built-in content moderation tools, if it has them, and or determining whether or not you have to build your own content moderation tools along with what your hosted mo foundation model provider has to filter and flag potentially harmful or invalid outputs. Uh, the second one is API access and control. From an architecture perspective, you don't want people going behind the scenes and talking to your models um, without you knowing about it. Um, mm -hmm. So making sure we programmatically define specific constraints and parameters. Uh, I do know lots of models now are actually in their return pay mode or specifying confidence intervals associated with the responses. So where that's possible, you can start to error trap for that in your code. So if a, if a response comes back and it's at 30% and it seems like it's the even the model is telling you it's not terrific, uh, that's something that you can track for like an exception uh, from an implementation point of view. And then fine tuning and customization. It's exploring like how do you fine tune the model based on your data sets? What is the data that you're providing to it from a library point of view um, so that the model, when it consults that data, is it accessing biased information uh, or tokenized, un untokenized information or PII and things like that? I really enjoy ending on a like such, you know, a whole this this sort of set of like, here are things you can do. So I want to make sure we actually do the ending part. Um, it's interesting to see where responsible AI leads you. And I think as people might want to consider when they first started listening to this episode, this particular episode, like, oh, it's responsible AI, that's not going to lead to anything of uh, great practical significance to me. And, and here we are. So it seems to me that responsible AI has a lot to teach us in addition to like, be nice to other people thing, you know? Um, so I think that's very cool. So thank you both for, for being part of this. And I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode of Armchair Architects here on the Azure Enablement Show. I hope you'll join us on a future episode. <laughs>